Right, Wet. How you doing, man? Good, Peter. Good to, Good to see uh, you. Yeah, you you uh, you always knew you'd get on my show, didn't you? <laughs> well, I mean, it started with you on my show, and now here we are. Yeah, got that. When was that? Three years ago. Jesus, man. Three years ago. Crypto wow. Commission podcast. Yeah, God. Uh, and we hung out in Latvia. We did. Which was cool. Yeah, that was Baltic Honey Badger. It's fun. And now you're a hugely successful businessman in a very short space of time. We're fortunate to be able to serve a lot of clubs that were mine. Yeah. Right. So I want to talk to you about a few things. I okay. want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about as much as your backstory as you want to talk about sure. because, like, your tweet thread was super interesting. I mean, my director Neil wanted to talk to you because he was like, "This is a fascinating story." I want to talk to you about Compass and scaling that. And yep. by the way, thank you for sponsoring the podcast. I appreciate that. And uh, I also want to talk to you about you've had some scaling issues recently. We have. Scaling yeah. issues are a growing pains. Growing pains are a problem of every part of Bitcoin. We we could talk about that. Uh, lots to talk about, man. But great to have you here in London. We're gonna have dinner later. It's a beautiful city. It's my first time here. I mean, it's the second best city in the UK behind Bedford, and uh, <laughs> soon to have uh, a competing football team. Give there it a few go. seasons. Uh, there we go. Might have bought a football club today. We can talk about that as well. All right, man. Listen, let's do the backstory because sure. uh, you've been a Bitcoin. For, well, I don't know how long for actually. When, what's your origin story? So I bought the top in 2017. Yep. So if I go look back at my trading journal, it was like 17,800. Uh, and it was all the money that I had in the world, just everything. And I took out a $36,000 loan Wow. to buy the top. So and that was December of 2017. End of uh, Q2 2018 is when I started mining and started the podcast right after that. And our first conversation was in the summer of 2018. That was God. when it all started. It's, it, they always seem so long ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I barely remember. I mean, 17, I remember. Because yeah. it was a lot of fun and I was trading a lot of crypto shit. But I don't remember 18 at all. It's a really <laughs> vague. I think, do you know what it was? Is uh, The podcast wasn't making any money. I lost all my crypto gains because I was in crypto, not Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And I was close to going broke. Yeah. I was close. I nearly lost my house. Well, I mean, so your brain does this when there's rough times, right? Like you get through it and then it puts it in this place so that you have to actually think back on the bad times as opposed to just having those memories easily recalled. Like you can recall good times you have very, very simply, but the bad times, your brain buries them. And thankfully, right, you you missed 2018 for good reason. Now you don't have to look back on it constantly. You can just celebrate and enjoy what's going on in life. It's a bit like uh, telling truth and telling lies. Telling the truth is really easy because <clears throat> you remember what happened. Right. But when you tell lies, it's like you, you can't remember it. I mean, there's a very uh, known person in the Bitcoin space who is a compulsive liar and is struggling to connect all his lies at the mm. moment through his various lawsuits. And uh, <laughs> and that's the difficult. You tangle, you, you weave this tangled web and it's, it's hard to remember everything. But uh, no, I don't remember eating well. I don't remember a lot about 19 after the lockdown as well. The whole lockdown is really vague. That's the, I was trying to think when the lockdown actually started. March, Mar- in the UK, it was March uh, 20. Not, it no, was 2020, right? It wasn't 2019. Shit, Jesus. Yeah. 20. So that we, this, this was the same thing. in 19 thing. then. Yeah. yeah. 19, I think, because it all started at the end of 19. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I remember now. That's when I went out to Venezuela and then went to El Salvador did I go down to Salvador? How is Venezuela? Dude, I love Venezuela. It's, hmm, how do I explain it? I mean, it felt cool because I was going to make a secret film. We had to sneak in and say we're tourists. And, sure. Uh, but we went out to make a film, and the first thing I noticed was at the airport, I went to the bathroom, and there was just no soap to wash your hands. Mm. I was like, huh, okay. You just would expect that, and there isn't. And then we went to the hotel and we stayed in the best hotel in Caracas and it was you know, very cheap. And we ordered a beer and the beers came out and they were smaller than these bottles. They were wow. tiny. The shrinkflation, they were tiny. Um, and we did some stupid things like we went to the slums without any security and did an interview. Brave. And then we nearly got arrested afterwards. We were pulled over by the police and <laughs> they wanted to know what we were doing. And you know, we managed to, we said we're tourists and they wanted to look through our footage. Luckily they didn't. Um, And then when we left, we had to have this whole plan whereby we backed up the cards. Uh, So somebody in Venezuela had a copy of the cards and we went through the airport with them. Um, Nervous, very nervous, but I I loved it. The people are amazing. The food is incredible. It's just a place that's completely fucked. 
the, the more interesting place was when I went in Colombia, we went to Cucuta on the border, and every day thousands of people coming over the border just to buy basic necessities that they can't get in the country. Mm. And I met some guy who was there with his uh, daughter and his wife. They'd been sleeping on the street. Hold on, are you interviewing me again? See, this is your old podcast. It's good. You can't get it it's out good. of you. Yeah. But uh, and he was struggling to find work, and uh, and I was I had some money on it. I gave him like 60 bucks just to help him, and he fucking broke down in tears. Like, wow. He was really upset. And the guys would said, because he went straight back into Venezuela. Yeah. And he said, no, he can feed his family for three months now. I was like, what? That's crazy. Well, this is all, this all ties into why I moved out of mining altcoins and into mining Bitcoin. Right. Because, I mean, the gains from mining altcoins, they're great, right? It kept me alive in 2018. Um, but the, the purpose, the ethos, everything behind Bitcoin's mission is what mentally cause the shift. If you're going to dedicate your life to something, it should be something that's got that's got meaning and purpose. And I think that this provides, I mean, I know it does, right? We're seeing in El Salvador, El Salvador you're talking about in Venezuela, um, Latvia, other parts of Eastern Europe are experiencing this as well. It allows people to have a life that they never otherwise would. And it's not just wealth that it creates, it's the just daily functions of a normal life, you know, being able to purchase things or bank your own money, you know? which we take for granted. Yeah, I mean, just look at the collapse in Lebanon of their currency. Yeah. Turkey, <clears throat> is Turkey up to 20% inflation now, even higher? I can't I remember. I mean, Argentina's at, I think, 40 to 50%. I mean, the inflation is rampant in these places. Uh, but yeah, that dedication to Bitcoin, because I think it was in, I can't remember if it was 18 or 19, where I went Bitcoin only, but yeah, I realized the mission. But one of my realizations this year was that when I went Bitcoin only, it became a bit of a maxi, started like mm. slagging off altcoins. I kind of had to question like, why am I, what's my problem with altcoins? And then I realized actually, I, I don't actually care that they exist. They're mm. just different. It's like being into, it's like being into cars and caring what bicycles are doing. Sure. I suddenly realized I actually don't really care that much because who cares if someone wants to buy Ethereum or who cares if someone wants to buy a, an NFT? I'll tell them it's stupid. But actually, I don't care. I just want right. to focus on Bitcoin because... The mission of Bitcoin, uh, the only time I get pissed off is where somebody wants Solana or ETH to flip Bitcoin or mm -hmm. they say ultrasound money and they're trying sure. to compare to Bitcoin. It's like, fuck off. But well, actually, I don't care otherwise. Well, I mean, it, okay, so the cliche, the old saying is a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still, right? So it, it doesn't matter. Like you're shouting into a void. If somebody has an opinion, let them have it. We, we talk about being libertarian or being free thinkers. Uh, we just have to let people be, you know, people are going to come to their own realizations. If in 2018, when I was mining altcoins, if somebody would have just beat into my head that I was doing the wrong thing with my nature, I probably never would have made it to Bitcoin mm. because I would be like, fuck you, I'm going to do what I want. Right. And you have to let people come to that on their own. And once they're here, they're here. Right. But you just got, you got to let them take that journey to get here on their own. And I think that that's as a, as an asset class, as a, you know, a group of people, um, it's fine to be toxic. It's, it's fine. If people want to be toxic, that's fine. Be them. They should be themselves. But they have to understand that the majority of the population isn't going to respond to that in a way that makes, makes it this good for anyone. You know, you can't scream people out of all coins or, or anything, yeah. any decision, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's an inertia that comes with that. So I actually just did a fascinating interview with uh, Eric Voorhees and Alex Gladstein. They had a discussion regard. I don't know if you heard it, but I did. you did, yeah. yeah. It was a fascinating discussion. Um, Eric Voorhees, you know, you can go into the comments. He puts up a very good argument for altcoins, why mm -hmm. he cares for them. And, and, and Alex did a robust defense of Bitcoin and against altcoins. But I realized they were arguing from two completely different places. Eric was ar arguing as a libertarian, mm -hmm. believing that let the market decide, anyone can create anything they want because we don't want government interference. I was like, okay, I can, I can agree with that. Sure. And I think Alex was arguing from a point of protection and uh, uh, honesty and you know, what these you know, platforms promise to do and what they do deliver. And, yeah. and I think really just, I think the thing is Alex really wants Bitcoin to be successful and doesn't want those distractions. But they, they actually kind of argued past each other because I think they argued from, because Alex isn't a libertarian. Correct. So if you're not a libertarian, then what are you? You believe in democracy. And I think Alex does. I don't think I'm misquoting him here. And I think his belief, therefore, is if you if you have democracy, you have government, and government sure. should maybe regulate some of these things because they're, they're bullshit. 
if I've misquoted you, Alex, I apologize. But but it was a really interesting uh, discussion, uh, and I came out of it thinking, I'm just going to focus on Bitcoin. Sure, <laughs> that's that's my that's right. my place. Well, I, we all have to carve out our own our own niche, right? I mean, with Compass, we want it, We're a Bitcoin first company, mm-hmm. but you know, we sell ASICs, and ASICs manufactured by Bitmain support different coins. If a customer comes to us and says, "I want to buy a Litecoin ASIC," and we have them to sell, we're going to sell them, right? Because what what does that matter? Ninety nine point nine percent of what we sell supports the Bitcoin network and Bitcoin's blockchain. But I mean, we're a business. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we have to serve the people that we serve and give them what they want. So, you know, it's 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 fine to take this stance when it's you personally. But when you're looking at you know as a business or uh, with other people that you're interacting with, everyone has to have their their own opinion and form it for themselves. And I think that it just it leads to a stronger community overall. Well, so we have, we have a similar thing with sponsors. So my view on sponsors is if you want to sponsor the podcast, we have a rate. If you want to pay it, you can be the sponsor. But we have one rule. You have to have a Bitcoin product. And it kind of has to be your main product. Sure. So if you're a altcoin company or a uh, token, obviously mm-hmm. there's zero interest. You can't sponsor the podcast. And I've had a couple of uh, – I had a fund recently get in touch. Mm. And they are a quant trading fund okay. across all assets. Yep. But I rejected that one because basically it wasn't really a Bitcoin product. They would just trade Bitcoin at the right time. Right. But Gemini, a great sponsor, Cameron, Tyler, whatever people say, they are big supporters of Bitcoin, done a lot for Bitcoin. Sure. You know, they own a lot of Bitcoin. And right. yeah, they can sponsor the podcast. I only promote their Bitcoin product. So, I, I, you know, that Bitcoin only thing, great for everyone who does it. I fully support them and appreciate them. But I, I, I going back to what Eric said, it's like, you sometimes you got to let the market figure itself out. And yeah. I found my market, you found your market. And we should talk, let's talk about, um, talk about the origin of Compass because, you know, you're obviously an ambitious person. I tried a few things, tried the podcast. You know, mm-hmm. Did you do two podcasts? Three. Three podcasts. Yeah. So the first podcast was the Crypto Commission podcast. I was still just trying to find my voice, trying to figure out this industry. Um, all of the podcasts that I started were to learn from people the only purpose of them. It wasn't to, to make money. It was just because prior to this, uh, I had a, a heavy dose of mentorship in my life and traditional business. So coming into this space, I wanted to have this brain trust that I could draw from. And nobody gives you the time of day. But if you have a podcast, now you've got a platform that they can leverage to promote them themselves. So that was the idea. So the first podcast didn't really, well, I, I shouldn't say it didn't go anywhere. It led me to connect with uh, a group of traders, Bitcoin bravado at the time. Uh, and then I started hosting their podcast and live stream. And that is where I learned how to trade, um, was able to thankfully recover everything that I'd lost in 2018. And it really got me attuned to how everything within the Bitcoin and, and crypto community in the space worked, seeing how businesses moved, how money is moving, where funding comes from, which VCs are important for certain businesses. Um, and how each community responds to certain products. Mm-hmm. So it was after that, that's when I like went heavy into mining, launched the Hashrate podcast. And the Hashrate podcast is still in effect today. It's just the Compass podcast, mm-hmm. now hosted by you know Zach and Will. Um, but that was 100% mining focused. And if you go back to the old episodes, you can literally see when I became a Bitcoiner because it's okay. like, GPU, GPU, GPU. I went to a, the Fidelity Mining Summit in 2019, and then every episode after that was focused on Bitcoin. Interesting. My last non-Bitcoin show was Peter Risen before the show went Bitcoin only. Now, listen, I have, I, I do still cover all coins in sure. that I will allow a debate between <clears throat> two people mm-hmm. to cover something, but I don't. I will never have an altcoin specific show. Sure. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a good transition. But anyway, uh, okay. Compass, what what happened? When did this happen? Because the speed of growth is insane. So, and I think that that's, that's just a product of people knowing that mining is available to them, yeah. right? So in the summer of 2020, in summer, yeah, summer of 2020, uh, Paul Gosker, Thomas Heller, and I all got together and we're talking about, uh, you know, making Bitcoin mining more accessible to everyone. And we officially started Compass in August of 2020. The platform launched in October of 2020. And, you know, since then, it's just been, it's been a great ride. We've got to help, you know, over 5,000 people start mining. We're in, you know, 17 data centers in five countries. Um, and right now the plebs are contributing about 45 megawatts, uh, of, or they're consuming about 45 megawatts of power and contributing almost one exahash to Bitcoin's network. Actually, 
depending on when this show goes live, one axa hash of Bitcoin's hash rate will be controlled by the plebs, which what, is what percentage exciting. is that? Uh, it's about a, a half a half a percent. Half a percent in a year. Yes. So the goal is five percent by next year, by the okay. end of next year. Wow. But the cool thing is, it's like it's not controlled by us. Like it's not yep. me, right? It's not Compass's board of directors. It's hundreds and thousands of people around the world that have their own machines. Does Compass mine at all? We don't. You don't no mine self mining. At all. We have machines that we run, but those machines are generally replacement mach machines. So like when we place an order and we rack machines, we'll order a hundred extra, and we'll use those in case like a machine goes down. We can flip it out for the, one of the customers and put that on. Okay. Um, or we'll sometimes do. Uh, well, what we actually do is we'll, uh, once, if everything is perfect, then we just sell those machines spot. So we don't ever keep any that are on for an extended period of time, but there will be a week or two where there's some that are online while we, you know, get a, a group of machines that are all, all racked and ready to go. But your, your business model is e-commerce yeah. and rack space. Yeah, right. I mean, we're moving towards a marketplace model. So the idea with Compass is we don't want to be a broker. We weren't looking to to have really an e-commerce solution. We wanted to build a platform that puts buyers and sellers together. There's a ton of these you know, brokers in the space. There's manufacturers, there's distributors, um, but everything is done in Telegram. You go to Telegram, you're like, I'm, you know, I want to buy 100 ASICs. That's a million dollars worth of stuff. And you're doing this through some random transaction on Telegram. You wouldn't do that anywhere else in the world. You want quality products, you go to Amazon or you use another marketplace. So we thought, all right, well, if Bitcoin mining is legit, which it is, it should have a legit platform where people can exchange their products in a you know a trusted manner. eBay is not a good a good forum for that. Craigslist is not a good forum for that. And Amazon, unfortunately, is not a good forum for that because the one thing that Amazon can't provide is the trusted third party. There's no one to verify that what you're buying is what you're buying. And good luck calling Amazon and telling them that a hash board is down, right? Like... You have to have someone that knows the space, and that's where we've decided to carve out the niche. Uh, and now we're starting to onboard vendors. So a lot of these people who used to be competitors, we've now, you know, we can take Compass's demand. They can come and list their products. They're going to make a good margin, uh, and Compass isn't going to have their hands in their pocket. And everyone can can benefit from having the central location to purchase machines at a fair rate that are, you know, guaranteed by Compass. You're not going to be a marketplace for rack space, though. So a marketplace for machines, but you will manage the rack space. We, we are a marketplace for rack space right now. Okay. We do have facilities that are managed by other people. They do have to go through our screening process, though. So that's background okay. checks, site inspections, the whole nine. But we are getting more involved now in facility build-outs and facility management. And that's just a product of scaling. It's also, I mean, we're going to talk about the South Carolina issue, mm -hmm. but it's something that we've learned from that. Because if we aren't in control, it just becomes this bad game of telephone, right? Okay. Where there, when delays occur or something happens that's negative, we find out about it in the, you know, the 25th hour, and then we have to notify customers late. And it's just a bad experience all the way around. So Okay, well, we'll come back to South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. But so, so the mission really was is to make mining accessible to anyone, which is cool. Uh, you, you, you know I had a disastrous attempt at mining back in 2017, 18, mm -hmm. where... I bought myself 140 ASICs yep. because I'd made a bunch, a bunch of money. I took out a data center contract for a year, 18 cents. And after a couple of months of making money, I went negative And then I had to buy myself out of the contract. And then those machines sat dormant until a few months ago. Um, and it was a very painful, expensive, expensive experience because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Right. Because I tried to do it myself. And trying to do it yourself, you got to have the experience. But you've essentially made it. So I don't even have to think about that. Here's the machines, Pete. This is how much you're paying. Great, I've got them. Here's your rack space. Here's your bill every month yeah. done. Now, to add to that also, you got stuck and you had to purchase your contract. You had to buy out your contract, right? Yep. So now with Compass also, let's say you, you're done. You just go on. You register as a vendor. You list your machines with your contract. Someone else will come in and buy it out for you. So you don't, you don't even have to do that. So you want to get in? Easy. You want to get out? Easy. You want to get paid in Bitcoin? Easy. You want to get paid in dollars and convert to Bitcoin on the site? Easy. It's all done right through the platform. Were you not tempted to mine as well, though, as a company? Well, you might, I mean, I'm sure you've had the conversation because there is so much money the miners are making as mm -hmm. well. If you've got access to machines, you've got access to the facilities. Why, why didn't you do that as well? So, I mean, it's obviously something that we've talked about in, internally, right? And we believe that the strongest thing for Bitcoin's network is to have millions of miners as opposed to 12 or 15 miners with millions of ASICs. So our goal is to really decentralize. Decent, yeah. So there's like, a mission. Yeah. I mean, because we can talk this shit about decentralizing Bitcoin's hash rate, but in reality, it's just the same three companies that own facilities in four countries. So it's not decentralized. It's still one board that controls all of that hash rate. 
one DM. Right? It's funny when when I was doing the first scripts for the show, I always like I'm always like just give me some tips, but you know I'm going to do what I want to say. I'm going to do it in like peace language. But Blakely, she's amazing by the way. She was like very much. <laughs> I want you to just emphasize that you're contributing to the decentralized uh, nature of the hash rate. And I was like, I had to think about it for a moment. I was like. Shit, yeah, no, I didn't even think about that. And then, then I looked through the business, I was realized you are putting data centers all around the world. Yeah. And I was like, huh, okay, you aren't just a business who's trying to allow anyone to mine. You are actually mission-driven. So you've set your business model up in a way to make Bitcoin stronger. Yeah, that's the goal. And that's why we don't self-mine, right? We could get into self-mining anytime we wanted, but that's not, it's not necessary. And it's, it's ultimately um, just something that we have set as something that we're not ever going to do. And the reason for that is because we are a, a company in service of other people. You know, one of the things that we speak in, you know, internally all the time is it's relationships over business. I told you this before, we love, like we love people to the point where people think we're weird about it. You know, if our customers want to talk, I'll get on a spaces and sit there with them for five hours because I, I, I love people. Like mm -hmm. I love this, you know, this is mm -hmm. what life is, uh, is about. Um, and we always want to be that. We always want to be that safe harbor for anyone who wants to get involved. They can come to us. They can talk to us. Even if they're not going to buy anything, they can learn about mining. Um, and then if they want to get involved, we'll you know walk them all the way home and help them help them get started. Well, it's a great team. I've met a few of them. I met in the, uh, in New York. I met I met Eric. Uh, God, I'm so bad with names. Eric used to be my boss. Did he? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So Eric uh, Eric was one of the first employees for a company called PuppySpot.com. Yep. So Puppy Spot was where I worked prior to getting into crypto. And uh, yeah, basically, if you look at Puppy Spot's model, we've borrowed a lot of what they did at Puppy Spot for Compass. It's just uh, instead of breeders, you have facilities. Instead of puppies, you have ASICs. It's almost the same thing. Yeah. I've met Brad a few times. I keep bumping into him. So I bumped into him in New York yeah. and then I bump in, bumped into him in Texas. He's such a great guy. He's a really great such guy. Such a good guy, yeah. But it's a solid team you're building. Thank and you. Uh, the, you know, the service is great. One of the things like people don't realize, uh, they think I got a special arrangement with you. Uh, so one of the things, all my sponsors I want to be a yeah. customer of as well. And if I can't be a customer, I don't want to sponsor the product. Right. So I said to you guys, like, I want to mine. Uh, and people think uh, I get a special deal, but I have to go through the same customer service, and yeah. I want to. Yeah. But the uh, the service has been really good, and I know we, some people are going to be like, "Well, let's talk about South Carolina, which we'll get to." Yeah. But um, it is impressive the uh, service you've built up. But thank you. Let's let's deal with South Carolina, sure. Because you know, I know you did a thing with Stefan, which I didn't get to listen to. Um, I've had people emailing me, uh, yep. asking questions, and, sure. and our Telegram group. Talk, talk, just talk me through what happened. Yeah, so we, South Carolina was the biggest project at that time of the company that we had taken on. So it was you know, 25 megawatts that we had exclusive rights to sell. Uh, and we did, we sold it all. So to well, 23 megawatts of it. Um, and that was all supposed to start going online August 30th of, of 2021. So what happened is, you know, we do a final walkthrough before we send machines to, to rack them. And when we were doing that final walkthrough, we realized that uh, the permitting was not done. And by not done, you have to have permits in oh, place. Permits. Yeah. So electrical permits, construction permits, that all has to be handled before a site can be electrif electrified. Right. And it just wasn't. And the delays were supposed to push us back until you know, January or February of 2022. Right, which would mean that all of these people who we had already sold machines to who were set to go online at the end of every month from August until December, they would all be delayed. How, right? how long was the delay? Uh, it was until January, February of 2022. January, February, okay. Yeah, so you're looking at six, seven months, <sighs> right? Okay. So that was unacceptable for us. Um, we have a, a good relationship with the, the company that manages that site. But we decided that for this site, it wasn't for us. We pulled out, we canceled our contract. We got all of the money back for the, the deposits. And then we immediately set out to try to figure out how do we get 23 megawatts online by the end of October? Because I set a, a, like a big goal for our team. You know, it's in the first six months of us being in business, we'd put about 15 megawatts of power online. What I then asked them to do was in the next three months, put 23 megawatts online immediately and get every, make sure we have enough space for everyone. It was a lofty task. Mm -hmm. And we staffed up, we added about 40 people to our team to help with this. Um, and they got to work, you know? We told the customers, look, it, 
you're going to be until the end of end of October before we can get you online. We offered four and a half million dollars in credits to everyone that was affected. Credits um, in what just just cash credits or towards power towards purchases of new machines. Okay, uh, so they can apply those to their hosting bills once they were online. So all of that we we can't issue credits as a payout. Mm -hmm. Because then everyone have to KYC. Obviously, that's not something that Bitcoiners are keen on. Um, we also offer to ship the machines to people's home. So if you want to bring the machine home, mine with it at home, and then ship it back to us once the rack space is ready, you could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, or you could have a, a refund. Or because machines appreciate, we can sell that machine for you. You'll achieve that delta, and then you have to KYC. But we can pay you the you know the profit as well. Uh, most people elected to wait. Okay. So go through September. They're delayed as well. August is delayed. September is delayed. We get to the end of October. At the like middle of September, we start getting machines online. So we have facilities that are coming on. We're putting machines online all the way through September and October. But then October 31st hit. Well, it was October 20th. We realized that we weren't going to get everyone online in time. Okay. So we sent out another notification of, of more delays, right? Um, this is when everyone got very upset. And rightfully so. That I understand. Yeah. Uh, but we just, you know, there there was nowhere to put them. So we kept our heads down, kept working to get people online, and we have since continued to just keep putting on everyone online. So the goal uh, right now is to have everyone online by November 30th. We've got line of sight on those finish dates for everyone. So we're almost through it. Um, but it's been, I, look, I understand. It's been tough for everyone that's had to wait. Um, and man, it's it sucked for us to like, because like I said, we, we love people. So hearing the feedback, we want to be better. And we're, we're never going to be in a situation like this again. We've taken measures to make sure that we, we have redundancy on every facility now. So anything moving into next year, if you've got space booked, there's a backup with the same amount, the same amount. So if that space falls through, there's already a backup plan. Right. But yeah, we're, so we're getting the, through it. So the biggest scaling <clears throat> issue is getting power, getting centers ready. Yeah. 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 Like how complex? Like talk me through what's involved in building a center. Okay. So let's... Uh, most of the time people come to us and they have a power purchase agreement with access to a substation uh, and an empty field. So we have to get permits, we have to build a slab, we have to order containers, we have to order transformers. These things are all subject to part shortages. So transformers can take, uh, it's a little bit better now, but it can take up to five months to get transformers depending on what you need. Um, the containers can take you know six to eight weeks to, to be finished. And uh, and then once that's all done, you get it all to the site, you put everything together, you send your machines out, you figure you can rack between 100 and 150 machines per person per day. So every megawatt takes conservatively three days to get up. Um, and then you're able to electrify it. You know, once everything is racked and ready, you can, you know, you can flip the switch and get everything hashing. So it can take as little, if, if everything is ready to go, it can take as little as, you know, two and a half months. Um, but it can take up to a year to get a, a big site up and running. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And is that uh, is that just a logistics in terms of uh, finding and building out the space? Or is there like a big issue actually having the availability of the power? So the power availability is there. Oh, is that? Okay. Yeah, it's there. It's just where's where's the price point? Okay. That's one thing that we're looking at because obviously miners need as cheap as a cheap of power as possible. Mm -hmm. Um and then the other thing is just, you know, where is this in proximity to the substation? One of the things that you can get into, and this again is just with power delivery, if you're too far away, then you have to run lines, special lines that bring the power from the substation to the facility. And those okay. are expensive and they require a ton of permitting and they take a lot of time. So you, you, had, to, you had to like learn a whole new industry. Yes. And, and when I say industry, not mining, I'm on about power. Yeah, power and construction. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, think, I think mine are in Kentucky. They are, are yeah, they, they are in Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. But how many countries are you in now? So let's, let's talk about this real quick. Okay, go on. Because this is something that we, we get it all the time, right? Okay. Like, oh, well, Pete's getting special treatment. He was up and running. In reality, we didn't have anything to sell when you wanted, I mean, you wanted to be online faster. Yeah. Otherwise, you would have been in this affected batch as well. Um, and we, we asked some of our existing customers, we were like, hey, does anyone want to sell their machines? And somebody was like, I'll sell them. But it, you're gonna pay. Yeah, eleven right? and a half thousand basic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah and two two thousand premium on each. Yes. Yeah, yeah it was a two thousand dollar premium on each, and yeah. that's that's how you were able to get online faster. Is you actually overpaid considerably. Do you know what the funny thing is? We get a little bit here. I actually haven't paid you for the machines yet because this is a, this is a Bitcoin story. 
So I tried to pay you, but we couldn't connect my bank to your bank because I'm UK based and you're US and all, all those complexities. So I've issued you a credit on your sponsorship to pay yeah. for the machines. That works. But, yeah, but it's, and it was just like, for fuck's fucking sake, why does this stuff always have to be? That's my biggest headache is international payments there now. So I move into a Bitcoin standard. I mean, look, the, so I want to talk about the Bitcoin standard for payments, but the payment processing aspect of Compass has been the most challenging part of our business. Oh, really? Bar none. Because we are in this category where people can't seem to classify what we do. When all we do is like, if you want to be very high level, but we sell computers mm -hmm. and we sell co-location space, right? Simple. But banks can't wrap their heads around it. Processors can't wrap their heads around it. Um, you know, you know, we work of mining. <laughs> Or the the uh, the Airbnb. <laughs> the Airbnb. Yeah, yeah, fuck, we work. In reality, it's it's more like Expedia. But um, but what what happened is we got dropped by Stripe. We had to close our Chase account, uh, our bank, because these people just couldn't figure it out. They're like, I don't understand. You're you're you know you set up this this processing account six months ago, and you're processing X amount, but we can't understand how your business model works, so we can't process for you. Um, thankfully I used to be in the processing industry, so we've been able to get, you know, backups that come in, but it's, it's been a pain in the ass to just take oh. money as a business. Dude, the whole, there's the whole bank, like nothing has exposed me more to the problems with the banking sector and the walled gardens and gatekeepers yeah. to allowing people to actually create operational businesses than running a business in this space. And dude, I'm just running a fucking podcast yeah. with like seven sponsors, but I lost my personal bank account. Yeah. And then I lost my business bank account. Now, luckily, I'm, I'm moving to, like, so I moved to Wise. Okay. Who've been great. I don't do anything Bitcoin through them because they hate Bitcoin. Mm. But I couldn't, I, there's some, I tried every possible way to pay you guys through Wise, yeah. and Wise wouldn't allow me. Now, I'm moving to BCB, who are a UK based company okay. for my business, and I moved to Revolut for my personal. But both of those, not, not, not BCB, but Revolut have come with a whole bunch of issues as well. And I'm just waiting for someone to create the retail version of Silver Lake here which hopefully yeah. maybe bcb will do at some point but it is such a headache that's why it's just like i'm getting i'm moving more and more to be saying i want to pay in bitcoin and get yeah. paid in bitcoin yeah because it just makes life so much easier yeah i mean our godsend was uh was square like thankfully with square was able to come to the table and and bail us out and they've been a huge help in in processing uh, but the bitcoin standard is is something that you know, when it comes to, I'm kind of torn, right? Because people I understand want to want to sell their Bitcoin. I'm of the belief that like, I, I don't want to sell any of it. Like I'm a, I'm a hoarder when it comes to Bitcoin. Yep. So, you know, when people are like, oh, I want to pay for this in Bitcoin, two things go through my head. One, spend your fiat and buy miners and then convert your fiat into Bitcoin. And two, like we are facing now in the event of a delay or in the event that you want to refund, you you can't get a refund in Bitcoin, right? So I always am cognizant of that when people are purchasing with Bitcoin because if they ever want to get a refund, they're going to get it in fiat or in stable coins because when Bitcoin is paid through the site, it's immediately converted mm -hmm. because we have to pay vendors. So those are always, we've, we've went back and forth. We've actually turned Bitcoin payments off on our site for a little while um, just to see if people really wanted them and everyone demanded that they be, tur be turned back on. So we, we of course accept Bitcoin, but. Well, a full Bitcoin standard is, is a lot more challenging than some people make it out to be. Some people are like, yeah, you can do it. It is challenging. Um, it's a lot of moving parts. Well, yeah. I mean, look, I, I'm going to put the football club I'm buying yeah. on a Bitcoin standard. That's going to be awesome. That is going to be a Bitcoin standard. And I'm going to want to pay the players in Bitcoin if they'd yeah. accept it. But they might be like, no, I need the money. Give me it in pounds, fine. I'm going to want to allow people to come to the club and buy their burger and their pint with Bitcoin. Maybe no one will. But in the end, most businesses these days have operational costs which are in fiat. Yes. So the way I've done it with the podcast is two of my sponsors pay in Bitcoin. I used to convert 75% to pounds to run the business, leave the rest in Bitcoin. I don't, I don't need to do that now. So that stays in Bitcoin. So we, we, we're growing the Bitcoin treasury. Uh, uh, and able to use the rest, but it's amazing. But there are, I, I do want to gradually get there. But it, it is too the, the volatility. We can defend and sure. and uh, explain the volatility to people, but it does make it difficult for the aspects of your business which are running on fiat. Yeah, uh, I think we'll get there eventually. Mm -hmm. It's gonna it's gonna take a, a consensus to yeah. change, right? Like it can't. I can't personally change to the Bitcoin standard unless other businesses change to the Bitcoin standard because things have to be denominated in sats 
so that I can budget in SATs and I can pay in SATs and I can track SATs. Uh, but if you're still doing this mental conversion to fiat every time you're spending money, it's not realistic yet, which mm. is why I think El Salvador is such a big win for Bitcoin because they're on track. Like they could very well get to a full Bitcoin standard in the short term. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, a lot of our friends are obviously out there at the yeah. moment. Um, uh, I, another thing I had to say no to because I've been to too many things and, and now I'm getting FOMO. I'm seeing everyone <laughs> there having a good time. Uh, I think the El Sal I mean, I discussed that with Aaron a couple of weeks ago. So he was sat in your chair mm -hmm. and, and uh, I think it's very interesting what they've done there. Um, I still think it's, a, it's a, itself is a while away from a Bitcoin standard because, uh, because again, the volatility is is going to be difficult for people to deal with. But you know, they're making that brave first step. Sure, they're 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 making all the errors, the early errors, or yeah. you know, you know, the people are going to figure out. It's a bit like you know, in the very early days of uh, I can't remember who I was talking to this about, but the very early days of Bitcoin, you know, a bunch of people jumped on and created like. GPU miners and sent some Bitcoin around to each other and lost their, yeah. you know, probably lost their private keys with probably thousands of Bitcoin at the time, thought nothing of it and, you know, made all those mistakes. But from that, everyone learned. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a bit like, I feel like El Salvador is now the country that's creating the, you know, the roadmap for everyone else. Yeah. What, what did they get right? What did they get wrong? Should there be a national wallet? Shouldn't there be a national wallet? Should it be mandated? Shouldn't it be? But... You know, by the time we get to country 20, I think we'll know how this will work. Sure. Can we get back to facilities? So sure. how many different countries are you in? Five. Five. Yes. U.S., Russia? U.S., Russia, Canada, Iceland. Um, what am I missing here? Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, we're phasing well. There's, we have a very small presence there, and it's a, a larger client, so they're, you know, they're fine. Um, we're also looking at places in South America and then a couple of, uh, of places in Norway which we'll see how Norway pans out. But our focus is really on developing countries. Uh, and we want to allow our customers to diversify their geopolitical risk. Well, right. I was going to say, that's four continents you're in. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You're not got plans around Antarctica yet. No. We'd no love power. To. Somebody could build a power plant. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. Four continents. So that's great. So you are decentralizing it. What are the challenges of having it in different countries and uh, that you guys face? And, and I mean, are some countries easier than others? Like, mm -hmm. How does it work? So the biggest challenge that we face with different countries is the political risk, right? Like Russia. So I joke about this all the time, but a lot of Americans, when they think Russia, they still flash back to Rocky IV, right? Like it's Ivan Drago and Rocky and, oh no, my machines are going to, to mother Russia and this is a terrible thing. And in reality, the facilities in Russia run very well. However, I understand the fear that people have for putting their machines there. Um, so we, we are getting political risk insurance for those facilities. This is okay. something that we've started now. Uh, and then with South America, it's boots on the ground <clears throat> because there everything is, uh, how do I say this? It, it, it is a who you know game in most of those countries. So we are working with people to help with feasibility studies and building, but it's boots on the ground that it's going to be the challenge there. Uh, Norway, socialist government, they move slow. That's the biggest challenge there is Norway. Everything is great except for you've got 15 signatures that you need to get a simple step done. Big governments, you got to love it. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, I've got a friend who's just moved back from Sweden. He moved to Sweden for, uh, for a new job. He was there three months. He said the standard of living is really high. Mm -hmm. He said the tax is so high. Mm -hmm. He said it's, it's too socialist for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people argue it's not socialist. It's what, what do they call it? Social, social democrat, oh, whatever it is. Um, yeah. uh, but he um, he said it was just too much, and he's moved back to the UK. I love Norway. So prior, it runs so well. It does. And I was in the shipping industry for a while, and it's great. It's it's clean. Everyone's friendly. Trains are on time. Everything is great. It's it's just it's also beautiful. Like even if there was no people there, it's one of the most beautiful places mm. I've ever been in the world. Um, but they use their tax dollars well. Right? They make sure that people are fed and that they've got health insurance and that they're you know they live in clean places and everyone has um, a good good standard of living. So there's something to be said for that. Mm. But if you want to do business there, it's a slog. It just it, it just is. It just takes time. Once you're set up, though, it's great. Like for Americans, for anyone anywhere in the world doing business there, there's probably no more secure place. 
yeah, I went out there for Glastine's uh, mm-hmm. HRF Freedom Forum and I had a great time, but I was just like, this place, everything works. Yeah. <laughs> everything just works. It's not like the UK where your trains <laughs> are fucking late and everyone's miserable. Everyone was happy and everything works. Um, okay, so one of the big stories with mining over the last year has sure. been energy. Yeah. And uh, some would say it's concern trolling, fad, nonsense, mm-hmm. yada, yada. The, um, the mainstream media continues to uh, show that they're completely uneducated on this. The Guardian this week uh, talked about the fact that one – you know, one transaction kills like eight polar bears or some yeah. bullshit. Um, but outside of that, like you as a business, yeah, are you a company that just builds facilities and plugs in power, or are you cognizant to the environmental concerns? So we take the approach that we want to leave the world a better place than we found it. Okay, right. But we understand that our customers also have this mindset, and since we are catering to retail we need to make sure that we're appeasing the people who, who we serve. So we are focused on sourcing from renewable power as much as we p- possibly can. Uh, I'd love nothing more than to have 100% of our facilities powered by nuclear. I think nuclear is the best choice for power. But um, shout out to HBO for releasing Chernobyl a year ago and completely destroying the nuclear power industry because of that. Um, it was a really, really well-made documentary, though. Uh, was, sorry, 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 documentary, uh, it drama. Was, it was. It was great. It was. It, it scared was the shit out of everyone. Have you ever been on YouTube and watched the footage, the real footage from Chernobyl? I live in Latvia. Like I have, I have people who were, are affected, like they got cancer because of the the plumes that okay. went there but but have you seen the footage on youtube i have because that was what amazed me it's like i watched it i was like this is brilliant and i went on youtube and they showed they showed footage of the people running on the roof and i was like wow they like literally got this perfect yeah. it's, it's very well made so do you feel like chernobyl was like or, like yeah they probably didn't realize it became some kind of like propaganda against nuclear. I think it's all coordinated and they knew exactly what they were doing. Oh, you believe it's yeah. actual propaganda? I think that everything that comes out, timing is not coincidental. Really? Yeah. So you, you look at how policies are started and how – because you don't just shutter and, and decommission nuclear plants. It takes years to get to that point. What they do, the final step – is you put out the propaganda so that people are okay with it being shut the year before, right? So they were working on it for three or four years. They released Chernobyl, right? Everyone's like, oh, nuclear is bad. Then they start decommissioning plants. And these people who are now getting ready to start paying exorbitant amounts for power or facing blackouts are like, well, you know, nuclear is bad because I saw this thing and it's terrible. So let's, let's, like, let's just let this happen. But the nuclear industry is very different now. <laughs> Look, I think that there there have since Chernobyl, a lot has been put in place to make sure that it's much safer. Things are handled in a much different way. the The nuclear power that's provided, um, I mean, you can look at New York and how they're shut. They decommission a plant. And now you're being notified. New Yorkers are being notified. They may face blackouts. Right? We're coming up on winter. The last thing you want in winter, and we saw this in Texas. You don't want people to go without power. People will die. Like, yeah. And we're we're looking at a blackout in New York. Could you imagine? Like, like for it's winter? fucking cold there. Yeah. I mean, you look at how civilizations advance. They advance from the consumption of energy. They, you have to have energy to mm-hmm. consume, to advance. So why is this all happening now? Why are we, you know, trapped in our homes, but power isn't, isn't going to be as available as it was, or if it is, it's going to be two or three times more expensive, right? Why, why do all of these things start to occur? It's all measures of control, which is why we Bitcoin ultimately. And all of this is really good for Bitcoin. And I think we've all been kind of projecting that this shit was going to happen, but now we're up against it. Like now it's happening and it's like this, it, fuck, it just sucks to see. It sucks. So you don't see. think the decommissioning of um, the nuclear plants is just some, some misguided environmental bullshit i think that that's again just the the noise that uh the noise that needed to distract us from the real reasons so you really i'm I'm pretty deep in the weeds with this stuff so yeah no well let's go into this so why do you think this do you think this is some play for more control or do you think this is some play to get people just to pay more for power what is it what's control i think yeah i think it's pure control yep i think we have now crossed the threshold of everything being about control everything. You know, we, we, we have gotten to a point where, uh, you know, what is the saying? If, if the people fear the government, 
then there's tyranny. If the government fear the people, then there's freedom, right? We have, like, we are now moving to that place where people are being trained to fear the government. There, you obey, and if you don't obey, you better fear. And we're just, we're moving in that direction. We have given politicians too much power. Um, and I think that not enough people realize they, they work for us in most countries. They should right? do. Yeah. Okay, so I always find this interesting because like a lot of people call me a status cuck and I am historically somebody who believes in democracy is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I say, I'm a reluctant status because sure. I think every, I, I fear not having government, what that means. And I've read a lot of stuff Stefan Levera sent to me uh, from uh, Mises Institute and I've uh, spoken to a lot of libertarian people about, you know, and I spoke to Michael Alice and... I just worry about how society organizes itself and yada yada. It's just yeah. a natural fear. But but the 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 final threads of of my support for democracy mm -hmm. are being chipped away at. Yeah. And when people talk like you say about control, my my I always wonder is like, okay, say you are right. Yeah. Is this is this nefarious people sat there? Let's let's forget authoritarian states. Let's just say the 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 democracies we're talking sure. about. Are these people sat in the room saying, this is how we control the people more? Or is this just the natural organism, the way it works? It yeah. naturally moves in that direction. You know, politicians perhaps believe they're doing good yes. by trying to make a safer society, a better society. But in doing so, they exploit technology and they increase the reach of the the judiciary to punish people. For yeah. Do you think it's like just the way the organism grows? I think that everyone is just doing what is in their own best interest. And by nature, politicians want to stay in office, right? So they're trying to do whatever they can to stay in office. And, you know, when you get enough crabs in the bucket, no crabs are able to get out, right? Everyone's just pulling the other down. And that's what's happening is these, these politicians are trying to pull these levers of control because if I can remove control, then I can stay uh, control from the people, then I can stay in control of them. And that's all I think that we're seeing. It's I don't think that it's a coordinated effort by some secret society to you know oppress people. Uh, that would be some dark shit if that was the case. I think it's just the, the natural evolution of it. And look, it's history repeating itself. We see it, right? It happened in Rome. It happens everywhere. It's not like this hasn't happened before. The, the, we look at all of these things and everything has happened before. Everything. Like every business has already been built. Every, you know, every kind of government has played out in this way. All you have to do is read history and you see it. This isn't something new, but yet we view it like, oh, this is the first time any of these things have occurred, you know? Yeah, so in um, I'm going to be interviewing Brandon Quittam again soon, mm. who I interviewed before, did a great show with him because yeah. he introduced me to The Fourth Turning. He's probably one of the people who understands that book better than anyone else. And um, it was really interesting to to read the book uh, before talking to him. It's like, holy shit, yeah, it feels like we're in this phase. Everything yeah. that's talked about in that book is the decadence of society, mm -hmm. the coin clipping like happening with Rome, which is essentially the money printer. Yeah. Um, it does feel... It does feel like we're heading towards weird, or we are in weird, dark times. But try and actually try and actually picture where this goes. Like, if there is a fundamental breakdown in society, what it actually means is it's kind of fucking scary. Well, it's a, all of society isn't breaking down, and this is something that my wife and I have been talking about a lot. Is you know, okay, so let's say the United States is on a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. There's somewhere that's on its way up. So, Texas, people would say. Well, but Texas is the United States. It, it, it could not be yeah, the United it could States. Not be. Yeah. It could not be. But that would be that would that would be a, a brutal and probably bloody thing if that happened. Um, yeah, I mean, Americans. Yeah, I don't know how that would play out. But I think that there are other places in the world where we're going to see societies that are growing. Like I was in Dubai last week. It is such a great place for all things business and for life. It's safe. It's clean. It's easy to do business there. They are, you know, it's it's just it's it's very well ran. You look at other places like in Asia, you know, they they do have certain controls. They have a lot of laws, and the governments, you know, they're in your business maybe more than um, than some would like. But they're on the, you know, they're they're ascending. They're not descending when it comes to to how their governments are going. So I think that it's not that everywhere in the world is is on the downward spiral. I think there's a lot of places that are on their way up, but you know, when Rome fell, another empire started, right? And this is just how, how things occur. Hmm. 
Okay, so in terms of places like Dubai, um, I don't know a huge amount about Dubai, but what I would be questioning questioning with someone like Dubai, how is it for equal rights for, say, women, gays, I don't, I've, you know, homosexual? I've got no idea, but being a Middle Eastern country, <clears throat> I could imagine it isn't as liberal with regards to human rights as maybe somewhere like the UK tries to be. You could be right. Yeah. You could be right. I, to be honest, I, I don't know. It yeah. seems like um, they are, they are Might more. Might be good for business. Well, they're more liberal than other Middle Eastern countries, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you go, you go to a, a restaurant or a bar, there's certainly women are dressed however they want, men are dressed however they want, interactions are fine. I cannot speak to how they deal with homosexuality or anything like that. Mm. I, have no exposure to that to that over there so i i don't know mm. um but yeah it seems it seems like a society that is you know capable of making those kinds of changes to to support their population uh, it's definitely not as religious or um zealous if you if you will as other places in the middle east so you are you actually prepping or just psychologically prepping for where this goes because you know i've got kids yeah and i'm thinking about that mm-hmm. I'm definitely thinking about the future, what might happen if the country I live in, which you know, I've spent my entire life in, if that does descend into you know, something a little bit more chaotic. I, you know, I, I can't help but look at Austria right now and locking down two million unvaccinated people mm-hmm. and what that means. And I can't help but notice that there's consideration for the same in Germany and I think maybe even Slovakia. Uh, this kind of thing has happened before, right? With a certain group of people, you yeah. put them in like the like ghettos uh, to wear some identification. Slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't help but look at that with concern about what that means and yeah. where we're heading and and how you know and you know yeah. I put my hands up in yeah. confession at the start of this uh, lockdown. I was like, yeah, I support the lockdown. I support the shit the government's doing. Sure. We, we've got this crazy disease and people in China are falling on the floor and dying and, yeah. you know, they're cleaning the money. And I, I, I yeah, massively embarrassed about it now, two years on sure. realizing like I was hoodwinked like another other people, but yeah, so be it. But I can't help but fear where this all goes. And you say, this is why we Bitcoin. I wonder if it's enough. You know, we won't know until we know. Mm. Right. I mean, you you walk down a path and I mean, it's the same as being an entrepreneur to an extent. Right. You, you take a risk and you take another risk and you continue to take risks uh, in the thought that it will eventually pay off and, and you're working towards the goal that you want to work towards. I think you you know, you can set yourself on a path in life and you have to develop a thesis that you believe is correct. And then you just have to work that thesis out. And sometimes you're wrong. You have to course correct. Sometimes you're right. And, and things work out. I, and I think that this is where we're at. Fear, you know, fear is is natural. But I think that in this case, there's it's not going to solve anything. I, you know. So what's your, what's your thesis right now? So this is this is a it's this is a, a tough question. So right now, I'm I'm living in Eastern Europe. I'm getting to travel the whole world. I'm seeing how free and open Florida is, which is where I grew up. Uh, I'm seeing how free and open Texas is, Mm -hmm. uh, how free and open Dubai is, and how closed most places in Europe are. You know, for my my family, I think that we would be happiest living in the United States or in Europe, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think where we will end up will be, you know, as a little bit of a nomadic family over the next few years where we will be living in different places. Um, The challenge there is I have young kids, right? So how do they go to school? Like, where do they get that socialization that they need? Um, Because really, in my belief that school is basically just to socialize kids uh like, absolutely yeah. it's you know funny you should say that because i was talking to my daughter this week she's she she hates school mm-hmm. i don't want to be there i was like we can quit she's like but i want to see my friends i want to play yeah. sports but the, the 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 education program now is ridiculously out of date yeah and i'm seeing like bitcoin has opened my eyes to the bullshit that they teach kids in school I talked about it on the show before, but you know the control of language, the certain things that you have to accept that you shouldn't accept. Sure. My, you know, even the masks, right? Mm-hmm. My daughter didn't want to wear a mask. I was like, don't wear a mask. And she said, but I don't want to be that kid where everyone questions why. Yeah. Uh, and they still wear a mask in school. Yep. Same, same in Latvia. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I mean, look, it's who knows how it's all going to play out. All, all we're focused on or all I'm focused on is keeping my head down when it gets people, as many people mining Bitcoin as possible. Yeah. Um, and, you know, live, live as, as good of a life, put as much positive energy out as you can and just assume that that's going to be returned to you in some way, shape or form. So I think that keeping moving is a good thing because it, you know, once you're a well-traveled person and your kids are well-traveled, yeah. they will have the confidence to travel. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, you've got those bases. Yeah. Like I live here in the UK, right? But I can go to Texas and I've got a whole community. Sure. I can access friends and, you know, I can rent a property. People can tell me all the things I need to know to live there and yeah. set me up. And I can do that. And there's a good three or four places in the world I can do that, which is part prepping. Well, I mean, Bitcoin gives you options too. Like if you've been in Bitcoin for gives long you friends enough, well, everywhere. If, well, and if you've been in Bitcoin for a long enough time, you literally can drop everything and move and take all of your worldly possessions in your pocket with you, right? In your head. Yeah. So it's so simple that that you can do this. And I think the other the other challenge that maybe I've faced earlier in life already is a, a, I think a lot of people have had a very a very easy, well, not a lot of people, it's terrible to say that, but I, I'm, I'm feeling like a lot of my friends and the people that I know in the United States, they have had a very easy upbringing, right? They haven't faced a lot of adversity. Mm -hmm. So now is the first time they're facing real adversity and they don't know what the fuck to do, right? Because they've never fought do out of the Do you think everyone sees this? I don't, I don't know if everyone sees it. I'm sure like my parents are completely oblivious to it, um, but they're happy and they're in their, you know, they're in their mid sixties and they, you know, they're coming up on retirement and they, they've got their plan for their life and they're not really looking outside of it. You know? I think a lot of people are oblivious to what is going on. It makes I mean, sense. I, I'm, I'm always putting shit up on Facebook, right? My Facebook has become, <laughs> it's, it's gone from uh, uh, photos of my family and holidays to fucking inflation, You're that buy guy. Bitcoin. You're that guy. I am that guy. <laughs> and, they, and they think I'm a nutter. Honestly, wait, they think I'm a, they think I'm a nutter. And, uh, but I feel like, how do they not see this? You know, the inflation rate jumped to, what did it jump to, Danny? 4.2, is it, in the UK? 6.2 in America. Yeah, 4.2% in the UK it jumped to. That was from 3.2% the previous month. And I'm like, do you understand what this means? They are, they are stealing from you. I mean, look, the, the shitty thing is, like, growing up, we, I used to have to hear it from my grandparents. They'd be like, oh, a cheeseburger used to cost a nickel, and now it's a dollar. I'm like, and back in the day, you don't realize, like, you don't realize what inflation is when you're a kid. You're like, man, things have gotten expensive. And now we're living through it. And I think that, you know, people who are relating back to this just realize that it's been a gradual process, right? It's gradual. You, you're like, if you put someone into cold water and gradually turn up the heat, eventually you can boil them alive. Boil the frog. And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's what's It's just a little bit. We're just like, turn the knob a little, turn the knob a little. And now we're at the point where they don't give, they're just like, Let's crank it all the way up. It doesn't matter now because they can't, we can't do anything about it is how I think they feel, right? Because we see this, people see that what's happening there, they, they bitch and moan about it. They complain about it. But where's the action, right? We'll see that action hopefully next November when people vote in the United States. We will see how unhappy people are. They're going to vote for Donald Trump. I don't think I, I don't know that Donald Trump is going to run, and that's not at all. That's not at all. I don't want those He's, words to come out of my gonna mouth. They're going to vote for Donald Trump. He's going to win. Washington, California, and they're going to secede, and uh, you're going to have this little new United States up in the, the northwest, and uh, they're not going to have any water because they're going to get cut off by Nevada, and it's going to be a shit show. This, this sounds like the beginning Sexy. of Mad Max. This is a. Uh... I think I've seen yeah, this movie before. Maybe it is. But and look, I, I, it's all it's all going to happen in a way that is um, is palatable. Is the thing is is that's it has to be palatable for it to happen in the way that the government will need it to happen. So even if it's these dr these drastic changes, there will be a subset of people who are like, "Fuck, this sucks." But most people will be totally fine, and it will be life as usual for the majority of people. You wait till they gaslight us with CBDCs. They're doing it here in the UK. Fucking Richie Sunak calling it Bitcoin. It's like you what? <laughs> you, you, you sorry, but you can't. I'm sorry. Have, uh, I, have I ever said that on the show before? I'm sure you've said that on the show before. Uh, if you, you haven't, I'm glad. To, and glad anyone listening, I apologise for my language, but you can't because to call that Bitcoin is gaslighting people who don't understand Bitcoin. That is this amazing new technology. Sure. We we know what this is. Sure. This is 
going back to your point of control, yeah. there's complete and utter control of people's finances. And uh, they're going to gaslight us with them. I, I do wonder, though, I was thinking about the CBDCs, whether they can actually do it. Because I think one of the one of the uh, good things about the financial system being fractured yeah. is that if part of it goes down, you can use So if Lloyd's Bank, well, I'm not with Lloyd's, but if they went down as a Lloyd's customer, okay, I can use my Amex credit right. card. Right. Or if Amex goes down, I can use cash. You know, so whether a bank or a specific payment network, there's always something else you can use. But when you go to a CBDC and it's sure. on a single blockchain, and we, we know these shitty blockchains stop working. Solana stopped working for a few days, and you know, ETH is a shit show in certain ways. Like these things can stop working. If that blockchain, if it is a blockchain, stops sure. working, the entire financial system collapses. Okay. All right, so let's let's say we take cash out of society. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a cashless society and CBDC? In my mind, it's all digital ones and zeros already, anyway. But it's fractured. So if if Visa goes down, you still got Mastercard. If Master goes Mastercard goes down, you still got Amex. And if if the banks go, and one bank goes down, you got the other banks. So then we have. I think the, we still need cash, by the way. Well, and I mean, look, if if there's no cash, then then we're really going to run into problems with people who like to do nefarious things, right? Because, you know, you need cash for certain things. But if you're looking at a uh, blockchain, like a British blockchain, a French blockchain, then what? You have, um, like, chain swaps that allow you to convert currency. Like, how, how, what I'm struggling to understand is right now the entire system is built around, like, being able to trade one currency for another. It's a very important part of the global economy. And if we are going to this place where everyone has their own CBDC or 30% of the countries have their own CBDC, you're going to run into conversion issues, which means that all of these people, it's like moving to the Bitcoin standard. Everyone has to do it or nobody can do it. It's got to be one or the other. And with CBDC, is going to be the same thing. So I think it's a, a little bit of a pipe dream for them to say that this is, you know, this is how it's going to happen. China will do it. But China is a different beast in and of itself. Because you you have to like China can be self sustaining. You have to do as you're told. <laughs> well, China can China can be self sustaining. Yeah, right. They don't really need to interact with anybody else. Um, people are going to buy their stuff anyway, and they'll be able to just take the fiat from other people, convert it as a you know as a government, and then pay that out in CBDCs. Well, to be know. honest, it's all advertising for Bitcoin. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. How do you feel about this uh, last twelve months? It's been pretty wild. It's been a it's been a blessing, man. To be honest, like it's it's been, I I could not have imagined when I was like thirty four years old and moving back in with my parents to build a business that you should explain be what that it is because now. I know you moved back in with your parents, but what was that like? It was uh, it was it was brutal, man. So like we had um, so you know the hash rate podcast was you know, it was what it was, but it didn't make any money. It was a lot of fun. I spent all of 2019 traveling around and learning about Bitcoin. Uh, and that cost a lot of money. You know, I think I went to 18 conferences in, in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and then with Compass, you know, we'd raised a little bit of money from friends and family. Um, but we were still like, I, I was still personally spending my own money to do things like whether it was traveling or marketing or whatever. Uh, and we like, we spent it all. We spent like, like we were down to, we were down to the bottom of the barrel. So I moved my wife and my two kids and with her parents in Latvia and I needed to stay in the States. So I moved back in with my, my parents in Ohio. Um, Are you a Buckeye? I am a Buckeye. Go Bucks. Yeah. Go Bucks. Yes. Uh, big, game, that, big game coming up, Michigan. Yeah, we'll see. It's, it's been, uh, Michigan's terrible. So, know. you know, it, it, it's the biggest rivalry and the best rivalry in sports, bar none. If you ever get a chance to go, have you been to that game before? I haven't. The best game you will ever go to. Yeah, everyone tells me that. Yes. So, uh, the reason I know this, yeah. I've brought it up on the podcast a few times. I dated a girl from Ohio. Mm. And she said, You're a Buckeye now. Yeah. I was like, No, I'm a. I'm a Texas Tech guy. She's like, no, you're a Buckeye. Yeah, she Texas goes, you got to come out for uh, Thanksgiving and come to the Michigan game. I want to go. Uh, Warren Davidson said uh, he would go with me. You just have to remember, though, it, it's not Michigan. It's that state up north. We do not refer to it by name. That state up north. That state up north. We, we don't. There's no Michigan. But I like Ohio. I was there again recently. I went to um, I went to Cincinnati. Okay. Stayed a night there, uh, and then I went up to Mansfield. Mm -hmm. To a heavy metal festival mm -hmm. at the uh, Ohio State Penitentiary, yeah, the one they recorded the Shawshank Redemption in, yeah, which was so cool. 
You, like there was one site I had where I could see the stage and the band. I could see the old penitentiary, penitentiary but I could see the yard from the new one in the background yeah. with all the prisoners out there. Yeah. I was like, this is fucking weird. It's crazy. <laughs> We used to play basketball tournaments in Mansfield. Did you? Yeah. Uh, so I've been there. I've been to Columbus. Have we been to Columbus? Columbus is one of the fastest growing tech cities in the United States. Is Columbus on the water? Col it's on a river. No. In, um, Cleveland. Cleveland. Okay. I've been to Cleveland. Okay. Uh, on, the, uh, on the lake. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and again, great. I, li I like Ohio. Did you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I didn't. No, I was there for two days. Fast one. Yeah. And I left and somebody asked me that. I was like, I didn't even know it was there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I no, I mean, th th it, was, uh, it, was, it was what had to happen. Like moving back in, it was humbling. And, you know, for, for me my whole life, and I think for a lot of uh, maybe women also, but I can only speak for men, like ego is your biggest enemy. And nothing will check your ego more than being like, mom and dad, I'm fucking broke. And I yep. need to sleep here until I finish, finish doing what I'm doing. Right. Have you read The War of Art? Yes. Yeah. Stephen Pressfield yeah. is one of my favorite authors. So The War of Art and Turning Pro, those two books changed my life. The War of Art. So I, I read that years ago and I'm yeah. back re -listen. I'm going back through some old books now. Okay. There's certain things I'm, I'm going back to. I'm back on the Bitcoin standard again just yeah. to remind myself about money. And I'm back on The War of Art. I actually got it for my son and then re-listened to it myself. And uh, what is it you said? The, uh, a professional doesn't have an ego. That's correct. Yeah. I do. I've got massive ego. <laughs> it, it's everybody has one, right? Yeah. It's just it's just checking it. It's being able to check it and knowing that if you don't check it, somebody's gonna fucking check it for yeah, you. Yeah, they do. He does it for me. Yeah. We used to. We used. Me and Danny used to. Uh, when, back when my back was fucked, we used to get up every morning. Well, not me. We didn't. I used to get up every morning. Yeah. Walk around Bedford Park, do three laps, and I would call Danny. And we'd go through all the shit I'm doing. Most of it is me being a burk on Twitter. <laughs> but no, it's, um, yeah. I mean, but Bitcoin humbles you, right? I mean, it you does. you went through it with these difficulties recently. Yeah. They are savage. They are. They will come after you and yeah. they, make, they make you be a better Bitcoiner. It's iron sharpening iron. Yeah. It really is. Because if you can survive the Bitcoin community, everything will, will open up for you. So you raised a bunch of money recently? So not recently, but in January of 2021, we was raised 1.7. But it feels recent. Yeah. Well, the tweet the tweet that I sent was in June, and or in July. And the reason that I sent it in July, yeah, that's no, what it feels. It was, it was June, but we had crossed 100 million sales. So that was what million it was. Of sales. Yeah. Over what period? Over at that point, it was seven months, roughly. Your so, first seven months. Our first seven months. You did a hundred million in sales in your first seven mm -hmm. months. Yeah, that's fucking insane. It's great, and the, the oh. like. The best part of Jeez. all of it is that we were able to ramp up employing Bitcoiners, right? So if you look at Compass's like our team, the majority of them started as customers, but like aside from one, all had advanced knowledge of Bitcoin coming in. We've grown the team from three to now sixty-seven in the last you know eleven months um, or twelve months. And we want to get to 300 in the next 12. Swan have been great at that. Swan. Yeah. Recruiting Bitcoiners. What, what difference does that make? I mean, like, I know it's kind of obvious, but. <clears throat> well, well, I mean, so. They just get it. Well, it's not only they get it. It's again, it's iron sharpening iron. The same savages that are out outside talking shit because you're, you know, you're fucking up in some way. Now they're in the company, right? So now they see what's going on behind the scenes and they're just a savage and they keep us great. Like, I love it. Like there's nobody on our team. Like nothing will slide. If somebody's messing up or there's a problem or something needs to be addressed, there are four to five people that are blowing me up on Slack or, or you know messaging me to say, hey, we got this issue that we need to address. And it's great. You want that. You want a team that's going to keep you honest. Plus, they're very grateful to be in Bitcoin full time, right? So they work, they work very hard. They're dedicated to the people that they're serving. Um, and they know that like this is, this is it. This is their plan A and this is what they want to move forward with. So... Well, dude, you've built a great business. Thanks, man. It's very impressive. But we need to go and eat shortly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to need to get them to uh, get you to tell me where to go because uh, you're a sponsor. People hear every show. Uh, and Appreciate I'll let people know that you're, you're not on the show because you're a sponsor, which some people think uh, you can be. But uh, no, you can't buy to come on the show. Uh, I'm sure you, we had a conversation about you coming on the show years ago. Yeah. In Latvia. Yeah. 
I think I said no. You definitely said or no. Did I, or did I just ignore you? Unless unless that show got lost somewhere on the editing room floor, you 100% said no. <laughs> yeah, so I said no. And, I think uh, was maybe fuck off was the Yeah, show. fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> no, but like uh, even before you became a sponsor, I wanted to get you one. I, I wanted to talk to you about what's going on with Compass. I also just want to talk to you again, you know, have you on the show. And Thanks, Pete. It's impressive what you've done. I appreciate you supporting the show. I'm going to get some money out of you for my football club. We're going to create the Bitcoin club. We're going to get to the Premier League in nine years. The Bedford Bitcoiners. <laughs> the Bedford Bitcoiners. Uh, Rail Bedford FC. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do this shit. So, look, I wish you all the success, man. Uh, Thanks, it's impressive what you've done. I appreciate you uh, as a Bitcoiner and I appreciate you as a friend. And, yeah, keep doing it. And, uh, yeah, see you soon, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure.